Hi guys, really, really pleased to have Nick Teminello on tonight's workshop. Um, it's a very important topic which I feel the fitness industry definitely need to see. Um, most of you guys know who Nick is, if you don't you should. Um, Nick, if you wanted to give like a, a tiny brief introduction because I know you've got a lot to get through, that would be great. Sure, um, just a little bit about who I am. Yeah, that would be perfect. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be quick. I'm basically, um, I'm from Baltimore, Maryland, um, currently living in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, going on three years now. Was a gym owner in Baltimore, a personal training studio owner, did quite well with that. But I realized my main passion is, is more in being a trainer than it is being a business owner, and they really are two separate um, types of things. So I've basically gone from a full-time trainer who started educating other trainers part-time in around 2006 to a full-time trainer of trainers who still trains clients and athletes part-time. I write for a lot of magazines. I have a lot of DVDs. Um, I have a book out called Strength Training for Fat Loss on Human Kinetics, and I'm pretty easy to find on uh, my articles and stuff. Or videos are pretty easy to find on the web. So you ready to kick this off? Yeah, let's do this. Okay, cool. So. I really want to talk about this this concept of BS detection, and uh, you know that could be harsh. You could call it baloney detection. What we're really talking about is the basics of sorting through information. So, um, you know, the biggest I have this in my slides already, but I'm just going to jump ahead. The biggest complaint that I get, I try to tailor my education to the questions that I get, right? Um, and the biggest complaint or frustration I hear from trainers of all stripes, beginners to the seasoned uh, professionals, is uh, there's so much conflicting information. I don't know what to believe. I don't know who to believe. And of course, that causes paralysis by analysis. It causes frustration. It causes a lot of us to just revert back to what we're comfortable in. So the issue now that we're dealing with with the internet um, and all of the information that we is thrown at us is not finding information. We have no problem finding information. It's filtering information, right? Because all information is not created equal. So what I put together here is a, a very bare bones, kind of a 101 course for fitness professionals on how to sort through information. So you can evaluate it and see through some of that uh, confusion created by conflicting information. Um, you know, I put this little slide together just at, at first here. It's, you know, we're in a field where we have highly trained bodies but untrained minds. I'm, that's not saying anybody is stupid. We're all smart, but intelligence and being able to uh, work out problems and think through things are two different things. Intelligence is really, being smart is really about memorizing and regurgitating information. But being a good thinker is about filtering information and um, interpreting information. They're very different. I like this quote. It basically says, you know, uh, Thinking is a skill, meaning critical thinking is a skill, and you shouldn't expect to be good at thinking if you don't work at it any more than you expect to get good at being a carpenter or a golfer if you didn't work at that. So we want to make sure that we are training our bodies, but nobody in the fitness industry uh, is really, or not many people are really talking about training minds, which has really brought about this demand for critical thinking, which is something that uh, is a hobby horse of mine, which is why I'm talking about it. So let's just get right into it. The big issue I see when it comes to thinking and the creation of confusion is that we are looking at conclusions people come to. So we have this habit of looking at uh, what does so-and-so think? I'm always getting asked, Nick, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? And I always tell people, well, it's not really what I think. It's what the evidence says, what the principles call for. And what I'm really getting at there is what's more important than what somebody thinks, what the conclusion is, it's how you got that conclusion. So it's not what you think, but how you think, right? It's like mathematics. When we learn math, nobody says 2 plus 2 is 4, just remember 4. But that's what we do in fitness. We just say, just remember this, just remember that, or here's what I think of that. No, we teach you how to work it out, or you are taught how to reason it out yourself to uh, the process of getting to the conclusion. Okay, you have two fingers and two fingers on your left, two fingers on your right. You count them and you add them together, and that brings you to four, right? 
So then if you said, well, 2 plus 2 is 5, and your teacher came up to you, they are going to say, no, it's 4. You didn't remember the right answer. They wouldn't say that. They would say, how did you come to that conclusion? How did you add up 2 plus 2 and end up with 5, which is the wrong answer? They would evaluate the process that you used to get there. And that's what we need to start looking at when we're evaluating claims and what people think. Not what they think, but what is the process they use to get to that conclusion. That is more important. So what we're really talking about here is a term some people are familiar with, some people are not, which is epistemology, which basically is ways of knowing or the study of knowing. An epistemic process is basically how you come to know something. How are you coming to conclusions about a given proposition? So mathematics is an epistemology. It's a process to come to conclusions about numbers and patterns and things of that nature. All right? So we can all agree that there are more or less reliable methods, i.e. epistemic processes, of drawing conclusions, of coming to know things, right? So if I want the answer of how big the measurements of my window, because I want to change my window, um, I can either use my hands and kind of guess it out and say, oh, it's this big, or I can use a measuring tape and measure it. Using the measuring tape is a more reliable epistemology than just measuring it out with my hands and then trying to draw that on a piece of paper or going to the department store and saying, oh, it's about this big and showing how wide it is approximately with my hands, right? So in this case, the tape measure is a more reliable epistemology, a more reliable way of coming to know the measurements of my window. And if you use a more reliable epistemology, a more reliable process of coming to know something, it's more likely to lead you to reliable conclusions or conclusions that are more likely true. On the opposite side, less reliable ways of knowing, less reliable processes are more likely to bring you to less reliable conclusions. So the, the, when we talk about it's not what you think, it's how you think, when somebody has a conclusion, I don't necessarily want to know Sure, I like to know what is their conclusion, but I really want to know how did you get to that conclusion. So when Nick thinks this answer and somebody else who's a fitness educator has a, a, a contradictory answer or has a conflicting approach, don't just say, oh, well, I don't know who to believe. Look at what the processes I'm using and the process that individual is using to get there. And you may find one of the individuals, and you most likely you'll find, is using a more reliable process to get to their answer. Somebody's using the tape measure and somebody's just uh, using their hands in this case, in this analogy. So obviously it's more reliable to follow to, uh, you can assign a higher confidence value to the person who used the tape measure to come to that conclusion. All right? So this is what I've been talking about. All information and opinions are not created equal. This is something that we've got to get past and I'm going to give you tools and questions to ask here, but I'm kind of setting the stage. Um, this is something we've got to get past in, in order to reliably evaluate things. You know, we have this problem, and this goes more, I could, you know, this goes into politics and religion and everything else, which I'm not going to, to uh, explore. But um, we have this aspect of a relativist society where we have no standard to make reliable judgment on things because we basically say, Oh, well, it's okay that, you know, all opinions are equally valued. And, and you hear people say, well, your truth is different than my truth. And Bruce Lee used to talk about that kind of stuff. Well, I love Bruce Lee, but he was talking about that in regards to his opinions, but not objective truth. Objective truth is what's true regardless of our, uh, our perceptions of it, right? Regardless of what makes us comfortable. So... If we have no standard to make a reliable judgment on information, then you can't distinguish the useful ideas from the worthless ones, right? So that is the problem. So there's the, this is positive in that, sure, we're going to use critical thinking processes, but what it does is it's only, people look at that as negative. Well, it's only bad, it's only dangerous for the bad ideas, right? Because they don't hold up. So what it does is it helps clear the fog and helps us distinguish the useful ideas, the ones that are worth our time and worth our client's time from the worthless ones, which that, which that saves confusion and time, right? And I like this quote by Carl Sagan, if all ideas have equal validity, then you're lost because then it seems to me no ideas have any validity at all. So hopefully you can see the positivity in, 
in not taking a relativist, relativist view and having a standard for which you can make reliable judgments on the reliability of claims. So that's my goal here. I'm mainly here to help you separate training, nutritional, and health sense from the nonsense, and I'm going to provide you with some standards to evaluate information. In, in this case, in this 101 um, lecture, I'm going to provide you with seven questions to ask yourself about the claims that you are presented with. These are claims that you hear at conferences, you hear made in blogs, you hear in videos, you hear from in, made in books, and if they can apply it really across the board to any claims. I'm just making this specific to the health, fitness, and nutrition arena because that's what I do. But these can really apply um, to all aspects of life. And along the way, while I'm giving you these strategies, I want to try to shed some light on some basic concepts of human judgment and reasoning, which i.e. is social psychology, that's the study of human judgment and reasoning, um, that create, that lead us to use unreliable um, epistemological processes. Uh, and, it, and these are very common processes that are unreliable, yet they lead a lot of smart, well-meaning, well-intentioned people like you and me, and you and me are guilty of using these processes, I can promise you. They lead us to erroneous beliefs, and uh, they also cause us to take those, re those erroneous beliefs and reinforce them as true. So continually find evidence for a belief that is not true. We are all guilty of this. So... Before I move into this, I want to clarify something here because I see this as confusion. And this really goes back to this thing about your truth is, is uh, different than my truth. And, you know, we have to separate objective reality from subjective opinion, subjective taste, right? So people always say, well, oh, well, it's true for you, but not true for me. That's subjective. That's speaking in subjective terminology, it's not objective. The fact that trees are trees is not true for you or true for me, depending on our belief system or our political stance or our religious beliefs. Trees are trees, right? Now, you can call them what you want. The fact that water is H2O, you could say, I choose not to believe it's H2O, but it's still H2O. That's objective reality. So someone's subjective feeling of something only makes it true in terms of matters of personal taste. When it comes to things like you like and dislike, you are an infallible person. You, you, you cannot be wrong about the things you like and dislike. But when it comes to evaluating the evidence of our experience, looking at objective reality and how nature and the universe really are, humans are extremely fall fallible at making accurate conclusions through observation or uncontrolled observation, which we'll get into in a second. So objective truth or objective reality is the reality that exists outside of our perceptions of it. This is the reality that operates according to laws and principles that are observable, observable, predictable, and universal, right? So an example of this is it's objective truth. It's an objective reality that humans need to eat to live, right? You could say, well, I, I, I'm not comfortable believing that, it doesn't matter. It's still the truth, otherwise you'll die. What's subjective is we have different food preferences that we each prefer to eat based on our beliefs and taste and whatnot in order to live. That's the subjective aspect of it. What we're going to talk about here in regards to the truth of claims or being able to evaluate the reliability of claims is how objectively true they are. It has nothing to do with personal taste. It's about the nature of the human body, the claims about you know, what's the nature of pain and dysfunction and how to go about fixing it and whatnot. That's what's being talked and how to build muscle. These are objective claims that are being made in conferences and books and seminars through educational programs in the fitness and health field. And we're not paying for somebody's taste. We're paying to learn observable and predictable techniques based on the nature of the body, right? The problem is if these aren't accurate, if the information is not accurate, then we're wasting our time and wasting our money. We have to be able to figure out which ones are more likely to be true, objectively true, and which ones aren't. So I didn't want to have that confusion. Now, 
there's two requirements that warrant reasonable belief into something, right? So we're going to talk about, well, what warrants belief, how to see something that is reliable and something that maybe is less reliable. So there's two criteria that we want to get. So in order for it, to, for it to be reasonable to believe a given proposition, a claim, that's provisionally true. What I mean by provisionally is as we learn more, we may realize, have a refinement, and realize, oh, we were looking in the wrong direction there. So provisionally true means where the evidence currently tells us, where the best evidence current, currently tells us right now. Um, the individual making the claim must produce an argument, right, that is both valid and sound. So the two requirements to make it reasonable to believe something. Belief is basically the state, the state of becoming convinced, meaning when you say that that's, that's re reasonable to believe that that's true. It's most likely to be true based on our current body of knowledge. They have to present an argument that's both valid and sound, right? So by valid, I mean that their position rests on solid logic, not logical fallacy or logical inconsistency. We'll talk about that a little bit towards the end of this lecture. And by sound, I mean that their proposition, meaning the claims that they're making, or the claim, is supported by good evidence. So the question becomes, what is good evidence? That's a big uh, disconnect in the training world right now. Some people say they uh, value their anecdotal experience at, over science. Other people say, no, the plural of anecdote is not data, and um, science is better than experience. So we're going to talk about that. So when somebody provides an argument that is both valid and sound, then it meets their necessary burden of proof to say, okay, it's, it's reasonable to believe what you're saying. All right, so now let's, let's get on to this whole idea of detecting BS. What's good evidence? What's faulty logic? So really pay attention to the top uh, stuff that I have in, in red and in yellow. This is number one. Is the claim backed by relevant scientific evidence. Here's what I mean by relevant. Let me give you an example of, I'm going to try to give examples of things that are happening today in the fitness field. There's a lot of talk right now about breathing exercises to fix breathing dysfunction. And then people are talking about all the research. Well, if you look at the current research on breathing exercises, it shows, it validates the use of breathing exercises for stress reduction and pain management. There is not one shred of evidence that shows that you have to fix a breathing pattern before you can fix any other dysfunction or that you can fix a certain type of breathing pattern to back up the proposition that there is only one correct way to breathe, like it's through the belly or that's the most efficient way to breathe. No. So when I say it's relevant evidence, you have to look at the evidence should be done specifically looking at the intervention, how it's being used in a controlled comparative test, right? So that's one aspect where evidence from one area is taken in one aspect of investigation, scientific investigation, is being taken and used to validate a completely different proposition. So therefore, that's not good, right? And science is the best tool we have for objectively determining which claims are true and which are false, or at least the probabilities of what's being true and false. Um, so I, I'm certainly on the stance that science beats practical experience and anecdotal evidence. Um, so when I have the two and the two don't line up, you know, science versus experience, I'm going with the science, and we're going to explain why in a second. Now, sure, like you and I, individual scientists are biased. I hear that all the time, and there is researcher bias and whatnot. But the scientific method itself is not biased, it, and it has built-in machinery that gradually teases out bias and bad science. So a lot of people talk about, uh, they try to ding science. Oh, what about Vioxx? Look at Vioxx. Well, the reason why we know Vioxx is, was not good and the original science that was proposed on uh, Vioxx was bad was not because of any pseudoscientific practitioners or anybody on their couch speculating. It was because more science was done, better science. So it, this is a, a, a triumph of science. It shows that science works. So anybody who uses that argument as a ding, to ding science doesn't realize that they're just simply refuting themselves. The other thing is, you know, a lot of people have this idea that science is artificial and mysterious. There's nothing mysterious or artificial about it, right? It's simply a systematic way. It's a refinement of everyday thinking.
to make sure that we haven't been fooled into thinking reality is something different than it is, right? So I like what Stephen Novella says here is, you know, when people say, I disagree with science, well, which part do you disagree with? Being thorough, using careful observation, being systematic, or using consistent logic? Because when people say, well, I have a problem with science, basically what they're saying is, I don't want to have to be thorough. I don't want to have to use careful observation. I don't want to be systematic, and I don't want to use consistent logic. I get concerned with that. Two, is the claim based on anecdotal evidence? Now, I'm not going to sit here and say all anecdotal evidence is worthless, but we have to be extremely cautious of anecdotal evidence. And you know what? You have to be skeptical about scientific evidence as well. It's beyond the scope of this uh, workshop to go into all the issues of, of, of reading science. But the fact that bias exists in science in a controlled, systematic format should make you extra skeptical that uncontrolled uh, evidence, such as anecdotal evidence, is prone to bias and all these other things, right? Because it's gone through less filters. All right. So the reason why I'm bringing this up is that a lot of things in the fitness and health world, especially like in the corrective exercise uh, arena and um, alternative medicine, they're really based on a lot of anecdotal evidence. They're very, you know, they have little to no scientific, or the scientific evidence is either weak or non-existent, uh, but they're very heavy on uh, practitioner, uh, in practice, anecdotal evidence, and people who've done it, and they say it worked for me. So these practitioners, anytime they're questioned, they're quick to cite their personal experiences in an attempt to, one, discredit the science, right? Anytime the science refutes what they're saying, or to convince and to convince others that their beliefs and methods are true, right? So we hear this all the time. Just look at any Facebook debate, and you'll see, you know, oh, I've seen it work in practice. That's thrown up there like it's it's irrefutable proof. I don't care what the science says; it works for me. It helps my clients or patients. That's all the evidence I need. And also, there's a little appeal to authority there, where they say, well, so and so, you know, meaning whoever is teaching the course that I I learn this stuff in, wouldn't be who they are if what they were teaching didn't work. So therefore, what they're teaching does work. That's what their, their logic there. So, but here's the reality of this. Although these anecdotal claims may be true, we cannot rely on them. We can't rely on in-practice anecdotes of practitioners or the stories of their clients to prove the truth of the claims of their practices or their schools of thought because we can't be sure that these people, the practitioners and their clients, haven't misinterpreted the evidence of their own experience. This is the big difference between skeptics and people who understand who respect science over anecdotes and those who, res who go for anecdotes over evidence. It's that the people, once you've learned the fallibility of human judgment and reason and how easy we all misinterpret the evidence of our own experience, you become much more skeptical and you realize how weak anecdotal evidence really is. And I'm going to give you four ways that are all based on human judgment or the, the fault of human judgment and reasoning. In everyday life, we all do this, um, that ineffective interventions, meaning some, you know, somebody could use something, uh, uh, some sort of school of thought or some treatments or corrective exercise methods or whatever that could be totally objectively ineffective but could appear effective to both their client or patient and the practitioner. Right? One is the bias towards positive evidence. Now, I'm only giving you brief overviews here. I encourage you, on when you read these terms, go investigate them. You know, Type them into a Google search. I've written articles about them. Other people read more about them. But the bias towards positive evidence, it's our innate ten uh, tendency to detect relationships between two variables that are not there because we overvalue evidence that only confirms a given hypothesis. Right? That's kind of a version of confirmation bias, which we'll talk about uh, later. I have a post, I encourage you to read it, um, called Why Smart Trainers Believe Stupid Things, The Bias Towards Positive Evidence. Read that, I have some examples there, and even a little test you can take, and I promise you'll find that you are falling for the bias towards positive evidence. Regression to the mean, that's a big one, also known as the regression fallacy. So this is a natural phenomenon where things, when things are at their extremes, such as sp somebody sporting success or low back pain, they're likely to settle back to normal 
or regress to the mean. So I'm going to come back to the middle, right? So think about it. When you have back pain, you have people have good days and bad days, right? Um, people have good games and bad games. So the regression fallacy is the failure to take into account these natural, inevitable fluctuations of things when ascribing causes to them. So basically, when you somebody's back pain is at their worst, let's say they're at their, their trainer, and the trainer happens to be into the corrective exercise stuff, and the client goes, oh, man, my back pain's really flaring up there, or I just, you know, hurt my back a little bit. Well, it's going to be at its worst. So then that trainer may start doing some other uh, corrective exercise methods and stretching this and strengthening that or motor control this or whatever their school of thought calls for. And even if it does nothing, they're going to see improvements. Why? Because of regression to the mean. So, of course, in two days a week, four weeks or whatever, that back pain is going to get reduced. Right? That's what happens. So they're going to ascribe it to that, to what they did, but it may just be regression to the mean. In fact, it's more likely to that. That's why any ineffective treatment can appear effective. And it can because of this, what's called the post hoc fallacy. And the word post hoc come from a Latin phrase, means post hoc ergo proctor hoc, which means after this, therefore because of this. Meaning after corrective exercise, therefore because of corrective exercise. After uh, homeopathy, therefore because of homeopathy. I got better after I did homeopathy, therefore I got better because I did homeopathy. After I did corrective exercise, I got better, therefore I got better because of corrective exercise method, right? But could be regression to the mean. Also it could be placebo effect, which we already know. So post hoc thinking is the natural assumption that we all tend to have that simply because one thing happens after another, the first event was the cause of or at least influenced the second event. Right? That's a big issue that we have, and a lot of people go, so sure, I've seen it work. Absolutely, you've seen it work. The question is, is it because of the reason you gave it or it's another explanation, such as regression to the mean All right? or placebo effect? Also, self-fulfilling prophecies. This is like an expectation that limits somebody, another's response that in this personal training field, the, the client or patient's response in physical therapy to an environment in such a way that it's difficult or, or impossible for the expectation that the practitioner has to be disconfirmed. Thus, the expectancy of the practitioner is confirmed. And then we also have, this goes back to the bias towards positive evidence. Great example of self-fulfilling prophecies. Rolling patterns. We hear that real big in the corrective world and rolling left, rolling right. Okay? Nobody has established that rolling, having symmetry when you roll or rolling at all, has any effect on improving one's um, back pain reoccurrence or prevention or treatment better than any, nobody has shown that to be better than anything else, any other basic types exercises or whatever it is, right? Whether it be pain, athleticism, nobody has demonstrated that, okay? But if I believe, if I do that, so let's say I have someone roll to the right, roll to the left, and they don't roll as well to the right as they do to the left. So then I give them exercises, and of course the, the said principle says the body's going to get better at whatever you give it. Of course they're going to get better at rolling to the left. And I'll go, oh, I've fixed them. right? I've seen it work. Okay, yeah, I got them to roll better to the left. But the problem is I still haven't demonstrated that that's going to do anything. Help prevent injury, I haven't demonstrated that. Help reduce reoccurrence of pain or treat pain any better than anything else. That is the problem. So these are how you can have lots of well-meaning, smart people go through things that, whether effective or totally ineffective, and every day in practice see evidence that what they are doing is working. So I already talked about this. We have too much you know, conflicting information. That's the complaint. I do want to say that we don't want to complain about critical thinking because it's just problem solving. Um, and we, if we have, if we want to sort through conflicting information, we have to use critical thinking, right? All right. So it's just problem solving. Solving the problem of figuring out, well, how do we know which one of these uh, claims are based on good, reliable techniques and which ones are just misinterpretations of their own experience? That's what we're really talking about here. The reason why I bring up conflicting information 
is that when we're saying conflicting information, there's some realities that we need to understand that directly is in line with what I'm talking about here. What we're really saying is we're saying that there are two or more parties or schools of thought making mutually conflicting claims about how to achieve a given result, whether it be to how to improve overall wellness, whether how to re reduce back pain, how to bring balance back to the body, whatever it is, or you know how to prevent disease from some sort of diet, whatever it is. So when we have two or more mutually conflicting claims about how to achieve a given result, we have to realize that they can't all be correct, right? Because if one claim is truly objectively correct, so if one truly is um, a very effective way to minimize back pain, right, minimize risk of back pain, or minimize risk of developing disease, you know, via nutrition, then the other claims that can directly are, uh, stand in conflict with it are then false. So the fact that we know this and the fact that we have so much conflicting information tells us that right now many of the claims that are out there have to be false because they all cannot be true. Yet all of these claims have dedicated practitioners and plenty of clients and patients saying it worked for me. So the fact that each of these schools of thought whether it be in training, alternative medicine, diet, what have you, claim to be achieving the same results, whether it be working with back pain, improving athleticism, um, re 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 becoming more resilient, um, resisting, uh, becoming more, uh, less prone to disease, what have you, losing fat. The fact is they're all claiming to have the same results in these different arenas, but using mutually conflicting methods to get there reveals a deeper psychological reality that makes a mockery of these anecdotal claims, the it works for me, or so-and-so wouldn't be who they are if it didn't work what they're teaching because they're basing it off of their own clinical experience or uh, impacts experience as well. And that reality is these things these biases, these misinterpretations of our own experiences. And interestingly, it really comes down to confirmation bias, which is basically a filter in which we see a reality that matches our expectations. Isn't it funny how everybody seems to find evidence to confirm what they already believe in their chosen school of thought and approach? Right? Because they're all, we're all existing in the same objective reality, but we're all interpreting it differently. And let me tell you something. Your culture tells you how to interpret your experiences. So we're all having the same experiences in the same reality. It's our culture that teaches us, that informs us on how to interpret that experience. right? So if you have a different school of thought, then you're going to use, in that case, our education is our culture then we're going to interpret the experiences that we find, such as someone gets a reduction in back pain, we're going to interpret it as our chosen school of thought did it. And someone else who has a different, maybe mutually conflicting school of thought is going to interpret it in their school of thought because that is how they've been taught to interpret their experiences. This is a problem. And this, if this doesn't highlight the problem with anecdotal evidence and doesn't undermine all of them, nothing does. So, I already mentioned the placebo effect, so more problems with anecdotal evidence. So, we got to remember this too. So, we also have the placebo effect, which, you know, we, if you study, you know that um, a more invasive of, of a placebo, so a bigger pill has a, has a stronger placebo effect than a smaller pill, and um, a needle has a stronger placebo effect than a pill. You can look into the research on that. So, you add that into regression to the mean and all these other things. So here's another thing with this anecdotal, it works for me, or it works in the clinic, it works in practice claims, is each prior generation of practitioners, whether it be trainers, alternative medicine, um, corrective exercise, what have you, were being guided by information provided in courses just like the ones we have today, using that very same reason as the justification for why it works, i.e., it works in practice. But this is information that we know now is deemed to be incomplete and mistaken. So think about that, right? 
The same reasons that were given for information that we now know is mistaken and incomplete is the same reasons we're given today, and yet we're told that we should accept it because it works in practice. All right? So clearly it works in practice or it works for so-and-so and they have a big name is not good enough. So, you know, the other thing here is when somebody says it works for me, what I'm really saying is I have no doubt you saw improvement with whatever intervention you did. I know it's going to happen through regression to the mean and I know through all the confirmation biases that they're going to focus on the hits and, and conveniently explain away and forget about the misses, the things that don't confirm what they believe. We all do this, by the way. We all do it. I do it and you do it. You're not infallible, neither am I. So don't think about this and think everybody else does this but me. We all do it. It's natural cognitive processes. So the thing is, when somebody says, I saw improvement, I say, I have, I have no doubt you saw improvement. But how, but you may have gotten it through the placebo effect or regression to the mean. The problem is with these anecdotal claims, it works in practice, all I know is it works for me, blah, 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 is they can't answer um, that, my, that question with a meaningful reply. The question of how do you know that it wasn't because of a regression to the mean and placebo effect, that kind of stuff. Because the anecdotal testimony alone, they have no possible way of knowing whether they've seen improvement through regression to the mean or placebo or through their biased perceptions or not. They have no way of knowing. All they can do is reassert, all I know is it works for me. And sorry, that's an epistemologically vapid response. So, as I said, conflicting info, they all can't be correct, but all of the competing claims can still all be wrong. They can all be the same, uh, they can all be different terp interpretations, misinterpretations of experience. So just because there are lots of different claims doesn't mean, don't think, well, one of them has to be correct. No, they can still all be wrong. They can still all be misinterpretations. They can still be all variations of the same general faulty premise, right? And if no, none of them are providing any better evidence than the other, and most all of them are providing the same levels of evidence. It works for me, and so-and-so is smart, and uh, they, it works for them, so that's bad evidence. So that's not really reasonable to create a valid or sound argument. Therefore, one, it, it's reasonable to re maybe reject any claim that's just providing that evidence. doesn't mean you have to accept one. So without, here's the reality, without objective corroborative evidence from other sources, or physical proof of some kind, 10 anecdotes are no better than one and 100 anecdotes are no better than 10. Anecdotes are told by fallible human storytellers. Nobody is unfallible, regardless of your social status, professional status. And this is why scientists are always reminding us that the plural of anecdote is not data. So I'm not going to get into this whole thing I've written I read here. You can have it in the, in the slides. So really what it is, is the verdict is in on this. Science is far more of a, far more of a reliable epistemological process than anecdotal experience, period. There is no argument. Anybody who argues, who says, well, I choose not to believe that, they're wrong, plain and simple. They just don't understand the way the human brain works. There is no way that you can understand the basics of social psychology, of human reason and judgment, and not come to the conclusion that science is more reliable. Why? Because science has mechanisms that tease out subjective interpretation and subjective bias. That's the problem. That's why it's an objective process. All right? So really what I'm saying here is when we understand our innate fallibility and reason and judgment, it's easy to overvalue conclusions we've come to from personal experiences. However, when we do become enlightened to the reality that the mind is a machine for jumping to conclusions, and that we often tend to misremember, misrepresent, misinterpret the evidence of our own experiences in lots of different ways. It forces us to understand that when scientific evidence collides with the conclusions practitioners have come to based on their anecdotal experience, it's far more likely that the science cor is correct and the practitioners have simply misinterpreted the evidence of their own experience. All right, I'm going to read from the last thing and then move on. Don't get this twisted. I'm not saying that science is always right, nor am I saying that anecdotal experience is not important. It is. The thing here I'm, I'm driving home is that we got to test. We must test experience against evidence. And when they don't line up, 
The science in no way makes the outcomes we see in practice any less real. It just means the explanations we may have given as the cause for why we had the experience is likely wrong. In other words, the effect experience likely wasn't caused by what we thought. All right. Also, I'm not beyond using anecdotes. If you've seen any of my videos, I use plenty of, of anecdotes. What I tend not to do uh, anymore, I try to get better at this, um, is make unjustified and unjustifiable claims based on those experiences. So I don't argue my experiences as fact, unlike a lot of my colleagues. Um, I'm going to really zip through this here because I'm, I'm noticing I'm getting way behind. So other thing is, what does other scientific evidence say? Sure, you could find a study to support any claim, but that's cherry picking. You want to look at what the body of evidence says and follow where the body of evidence leads. Don't lead the evidence by cherry picking only a study or two that already confirms what you believe. And make sure that if you're looking at a claim that's based on cherry pick evidence, that's a big red flag right there. Also ask, how does a claim line up with our current body of knowledge? So this is a quote from my book, but it's great to use scientifically proven, meaning the exact techniques have been tested and given the okay or whatever. Um, but it's, it's unrealistic to ask that everything that we do uh, in every workout, especially because we're changing training programs and whatnot, be evaluated in the study itself, right? Specific strategies and techniques don't have to be scientifically proven, excuse me, as long as they're scientifically founded, meaning they're founded on the general principles that have been repeatedly shown to elicit the results you're after. For example, if I show a rotational exercise, right, let's say it's some new version, it's not Maybe a, a, a research study hasn't been done on that exercise, right? But based on the said principles, specific adaptations to impose demands, in other words, the principle of specificity, it makes sense to say that this exercise can help my rotary ability, right? And if it's fast, I could say it'll help rotary speed. If it's slow and dealing with a heavy weight, I can say it might help rotary strength. That's based on sound principles. You don't need a study for that. Anybody who says otherwise, is making a straw man argument. Oh, I can't wait for a study to come on every little thing. That's a ridiculous argument. Ridiculous argument. That said, if I come up with that rotational exercise and I say, this is the best way to deal with back pain, now we have a problem because that does not line up with our current body of scientific knowledge. There's nothing in any of the other research in about biology and phys physiology that would tell us that one special exercise is the missing link to all people's back ailments. That's the difference between making a, a claim that lines up with our current body of knowledge and one that is so far off the path that it's unlikely to be correct. And if it was correct, then it would overturn everything that we know about the human body. So what's more likely? That somebody's just making a, a, a false assertion and misinterpreting the evidence of their own experience um, when their claim doesn't line up with the current body knowledge or that everything we know about back pain so far or physiology or whatever is wrong. Of course you know the answer to that. So keep in mind that questions about given interventions about the human body, which is what we're talking about, whether it be about pain or strength or whatever, they're not just questions about that specific um, training practice, there are also questions about the workings of the body, biology, physiology, neurology, and so forth. So ignore these ridiculous claims. Actually, somebody on Facebook today, and I just debunked it um, without using names, made this ridiculous argument. They said, oh, well, you can't um, criticize or question the, con the techniques that we use in my um, approach to uh, treatment because you've never done the class before. That is patently ridiculous. Anything that has to do with the body is not just a question, uh, not just a claim about a uh, treatment, it's a claim about how the body works, biology, physiology. And those are non-proprietary things, they are open to everyone. And if something doesn't line up with our current body of knowledge in biology, physiology, neurology, it's highly unlikely to be true and it absolutely needs to be questioned by anybody regardless of their what classes they've taken. All right. So is the claim we're using negative evidence? I'm going to sum this up real quick. You must have positive evidence in favor of the claim being made, not simply prevent negative evidence against another claim. 
We hear this a lot with alternative medicine. People bring up um, the problems with science-based medicine, but the problems with science-based medicine is in no way evidence for alternative medicine any more than evidence of plane crashes is evidence for flying carpets. Okay? You need to show positive evidence in favor of your claim in order to provide good evidence. Just arguing the problems with everybody else's approach does nothing to demonstrate the truth of the claims or approaches that you are proposing. Number six, is the claimer attempting to switch the burden of proof? Another one I'm going to be quick on. The burden of proof remains solely on the persons or parties who are asserting the claim, not on you or the skeptic, remember, to disprove it. So we also often hear this. People often ask the person questioning them, the skeptic in this case, where is your evidence that disproves what I'm saying? But that's a transparent attempt to switch the burden of proof. Don't fall for this, right? And understand what it usually means. When somebody asks you, you can't disprove my claim or try to disprove it, it demonstrates that they hold a false notion that just because a, that a proposition is automatically true, or at least more likely to be true, until it's been disproven. This is ridiculous, and I can, ex I can exa um, exemplify that right now. I could say you can't prove that Santa Claus does not exist. You can't. There's no way you can prove that Santa Claus does not exist. Therefore, it's likely true that he exists. Absolutely not. I need to provide positive evidence to show that he does exist to support my claim, so it goes back to the positive evidence. Don't let people switch the burden of proof. It's solely on them making the claim. And make sure you, you red flag that when somebody tries to switch the burden of proof. So, last one here, which is a series. I'm going to be very fast here. In addition to the anecdotal evidence that we talked about, people will use, people who teach these questionable practices, you know, the ones that have basically on weak or no science, because let's face it, if they had good science, they wouldn't need any of these other arguments. They would just present their evidence. Right? So they have to fall back on these other things. So aside from the anecdote, which we dismantled, or we showed how unreliable it is, although they, they propose it as proof, these practitioners will propose three other forms of argument as proof of the validity of their, the claims that they're making about their given practices. Appeals to authority, argument from ignorance, and appeals to history. I'm going to briefly go over all three of these. All of them are logical uh, fallacies, and you want to make sure you spot them, and they're red flags in your BS detection meter. So here's appeals to authority. In science, there this is from Carl Sagan, there are no experts, there, 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 um, there are no authorities, just experts, meaning everybody has their specialty, but nobody is beyond question like an authority, right? Now it's not a fallacy of value information from an expert over a layman, right? So those who devote their lives to studying a certain subject are certainly worth listening to when it comes to the areas of their expertise. But it doesn't mean, here's the fallacy, but it doesn't mean that all their ideas are valid and all their opinions are, are, are golden here, right? So if a Nobel Prize winning scientist is making a claim, they're certainly going to get my attention and they should get yours because of their credentials. But without good evidence to support that claim or to support their opinion, right, their claim means nothing. All right, so as Guy P. Harrison says, a good skeptic thinks less about who is making a claim and more about what is being claimed. So here's the takeaway. I see this happen a lot, especially with these postural assessments. Shirley Sarman says this, and Vladimir Yanda says that, and blah, blah, blah. Thomas Meyer says this. Okay, quotes from an expert do not demonstrate the truth of a claim. It's just somebody asserting it. An assertion of a claim does not demonstrate the truth of a claim, right? Also, the appeal to authority could work in reverse. Not only could it cause you to have to believe false ideas because of somebody you respect said it, it could also cause you to reject good, true ideas because it was uh, supported by someone who you disrespect. You know, we all have our camps in the in the fitness and health field. So the way to avoid falling for bad ideas from people you respect and missing the good ideas from people you disrespect is to think less about who's making the claim and more about what is being the claim, being claimed, which means examine the evidence. Argument from ignorance. So basically this is when you're unaware of something, you're more likely to accept questionable explanations, especially when it's coming from an authority. 
right? And the issue here is we're seeing a lot of these demonstrations, improvements in range of motion and whatever. Oh, it must work. The problem is that we think the only explanation, a lot of these people in these courses, we tend to think the only explanation for the demonstrations that we're seeing in these courses is the one the instructor is providing. And we hear this a lot, you know, I don't know what happened, but so-and-so is smarter than me, so they must be right about the explanation that they gave. You know, the other thing we hear that's argument for ignorance is there are lots of things we don't, we don't know. And the funny thing is the people who say that are the people who are trying to support their claims, and they're saying, yeah, well, lots of things science doesn't know. Well, if there's lots of things that we don't know, they're basically saying that they don't know either. But if they're doing the practice and they're supporting the claims of the practice, what they're really saying is, I don't know, therefore I know it's because of this. That's a ridiculous argument. But we hear it all the time by other, made by otherwise smart people. So in the other cases, in many cases, as I've shown here earlier, science has explained why things have happened. Science has explained the cognitive processes that cause us to misinterpret the evidence of our own experience regression to the mean, bias. There's tons of evidence for this, and plenty of it is in social psychology books. All the cognitive biases and heuristics and logical fallacies that we have, right? Regression to the, regression to the mean is one of them. So people are always constant. If you don't know that science has explained these, you think, well, they're unexplained, so I'm willing to take a more questionable explanation. First thing is, see if it has been explained. And the fact is, when science collides with these conclusions, practitioners are coming with, a lot of times they're saying, well, science hasn't explained what I'm seeing. They don't understand that science has explained how they're coming to these conclusions because they're misinterpreting their own experience. They just are unaware of these cognitive processes because they've never looked at social psychology, right? So I encourage you to start studying that, how your brain works, right? Also, the argument from ignorance goes back to this. You can't disprove it, so it must be true. Right? And I already said you can't prove Santa Claus doesn't exist. That is also an argument from ignorance. Another one we hear in the fitness field, and then I'm going to start wrapping things up because I'm already over my given time. These guys have been kind enough to give me, to give me so I hope they don't cut me off, is I hear this a lot, especially with assessments. Oh, so anytime somebody challenges a certain formalized screening or assessment procedure, they, they'll go, well, can you come up with a better procedure or a better screening tool? Or what do you do instead? And that, we hear it all the time, and that is committing the argument from ignorance. Sorry, this is not how reality works. Because somebody doesn't have an answer, it doesn't automatically make yours viable. You have to show positive evidence that yours is viable, and that's the step most of them are skipping. Last one, appeal to history. Love this one. Hear it all the time. It's been around for a long time, therefore it must work. No, wrong. All that means is therefore it must replicate. Okay? So for some reason, the, the sheer passage of time that something is around that was just made up a long time ago, uh, it turns into something that people believe is fact just by sheer passage of time. And furthermore, what blows my mind is that Things seem to uh, be especially credible, practices about health and whatnot, especially credible to some people when you place them in pre-scientific times. Example, ancient Chinese medicine or ancient Ayurvedic this or whatever. Okay? The fact that these things have been around for a long time doesn't prove anything. So the only thing that we know that belief in ideas uh, has been around for a long time is that, or uh, let me just read this here because I'm getting myself confused now. So we know that belief in ideas we hope to be true is as much of a part of being human as music and language are. So the only thing proven about a practice that's been around for a long time is that humans keep believing in it. It does nothing to demonstrate its truth. Only proper testing can do that. So if you want to know if something is valid or not, look at the evidence behind it. Not how long it's been around, because it's just been around by fallible humans passing the same idea and replicating it back and forth. All right? Remember, science is a refinement of everyday thinking. These are people who have not gone through that, uh, that there have been unrefined thinking, all right? Because it was in pre scientific times. Plus, it's absurd to place your confidence um, in having a first century conversation or a 10th century conversation about something 
when you could have a 21st conversa century conversation about something where you have access to all the world's scientific knowledge available to us. When we start looking at the wisdom of ancients and things that were developed in 1st century and 10th century and, and even the 20th century, we are eliminating all the knowledge that we've acquired since then, right? And, and these people who in pre-scientific times, many of these were developed by very superstitious cultures who sm smart and smartest citizens knew less about reality of nature than our seven-year-old does today. That's the reality of things. So final thoughts here, and then I'm going to take some questions with whatever time these guys give me. So <clears throat> being correct about one thing does not mean to someone is correct about all things. We tend to, to lump things together. In the same vein, being wrong about one thing doesn't mean being wrong about all. I've been wrong about things. I've written about it on my blog, and I've been wrong about things since. You have too. It doesn't mean you're wrong about everything. A lot of us are doing... Um, most of what we're doing is right, but we can believe a little bit, have hold some erroneous beliefs. I certainly was, and I was still getting great results with my clients because most of what I was done was legitimate and well um, scientifically founded, and I was doing some percentages, some pseudoscientific nonsense. I couldn't tell the difference because it's like taking 10 supplements at the time. If one vitamin's working, you don't know if it's just one or two or three or until you've done controlled experiments. Okay? So... Same thing with training. If you're using basic proven concepts with some pseudoscience and just unproven concepts that are unlikely to be true, of course you're going to get results, right? But it's only until you separate them and have them tested properly that you know which ones are more worth your time. So all claims must be evaluated individually. So a lot of times if you go to a course, there may be 10 claims. Each one has to be go through this uh, intellectual process. Sure, it's work, but it, it, it pays off. So what I've given you here is a set of very elementary prescriptions on how to evaluate information. Every step in the chain of evidence needs to be valid. Don't just give free passes. If something has some decent science, but the way it's being um, taught is based on poor logic, that's a problem. Or if it has good logic, but the evidence is virtually non-existent or really bad, that's an even bigger problem, I would say. So what you'll find is, and as I, I said, many of the practices, such as a lot of those that would cover the, go under the heading of alternative medicine or corrective exercise, which I call corrective exercise, basically alternative, but I'll get into that in future posts. Um, many of those consist of an element of truth mixed with a concoction of pseudoscience and, and sloppy thinking. So also keep this in mind. Everything is evidence. The evidence of my experience is evidence. Science is evidence. Evidence of my colleagues, experience of my colleagues is evidence. It's how strong is the evidence and who is presenting stronger evidence. I've already made a airtight case. There's no way around it about social psychology, which we talked about, that anytime science conflicts with anecdotal experience, the science is far stronger evidence. All right, as long as the, as long as the, we look at how the science was done and it, and it holds up. All right, last thing. Remember this, because I hear this all, uh, trainers are ahead of research, and that's just plain nonsense. That's what people say to uh, feel, make them feel justified for doing things that don't have good research or any evidence behind them. Remember this. There is nothing that anyone has to believe, any fitness professional or anybody in any other allied health-related field, there is nothing that any of us needs to believe on bad or insufficient evidence in order to, to deliver a very safe and highly effective service. I challenge you to find otherwise. So, last thing here, good quote, we're all very good lawyers at our own mistakes, but very good judges at the mistakes of others. And here's why I say this. Don't ever forget that these skeptical and critical thinking strategies that I'm giving you here that I'm talking about and the other ones that I'll talk about in the future, how to separate the sense from the nonsense, it begins with relentlessly applying them to yourself first and foremost. You cannot be willing to apply these to everybody else and not yourself. You are the first person that you must do this to. And that is a very humbling experience. All right, I really appreciate you guys' time. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. Um, I'll take questions if I have any extra time.